Hello everybody, welcome back to the Historian's Craft. Um, so before we get started, let me just first say this is going to be a informal video, I've got no notes or anything, this is just off the top of my head. But I want to talk about tattoos, barbarians, barbarian imagery in the late Roman army, and the barbarization thesis. And if you hear something, you know, as usual, the cat's running around, getting chased by the dog. Okay, so um, one of the main arguments for why the late Roman Empire eventually fell, okay, is because it was overrun by barbarians. Alright, I mean, that idea has some strength, it has some weaknesses, um, and in a fashion it's coming back in the historiography, but I'm not interested in that for this video. What I am interested in is a related topic, the supposed uh, barbarization of the late Roman army. What does that look like? How does it happen? Did it really happen? Now, as you might guess, that's typically known as the barbarization thesis, okay? So, this is the idea that the Roman state became um, weakened because Romans stopped serving in the Roman army, and the state had to recruit outsiders, barbarians, other, to serve in the military instead. And, after all, it makes sense on a superficial level, kind of, right? right we go from having the um, and I'll throw the images up if I can find good ones. We, we go from having the quote-unquote classic image of the legionary, so, you know, Lorica Segmentata, Gladius, Pilum, Scutum, etc., um, to whatever the hell the Roman soldiers had going on in terms of equipment in late antiquity. But is this really the case? Well, let's talk about that for a minute. So, starting in the 3rd century, uh, roughly, we start seeing a shift in military organization. And please understand, when I'm going through this, I'm trying to cover this in broad strokes here. Um, so, we start seeing a shift in military organization from the well-known legionary and auxiliary models, okay, to the emperors personally keeping large field armies under their control, and these are called the comitatensis. So, you'll probably be somewhat familiar with that term, uh, because I've talked about Diocletian before on the channel, and I would hazard a guess that some of you guys have probably done some reading on the subject, and you probably know, okay, that Diocletian split the military into the Comitatenses, who, as we just said, you know, these are the field armies, and the Limitanei. These are uh, more loosely organized units of border guards. Now, Diocletian does do that. Actually, let me restate that. Constantine issues some military reforms as well. So Diocletian is in power between 284 and 305, and Constantine is in power between 306 and 337, all right? Um, so there's a lot of overlap between this stuff. It's not necessarily cut and dry, not necessarily clear as to when every single one of these military reforms happened. Um, but, but, what you may not be aware of, okay, is that these two divisions, Comitatensis and Limitanei, these are not the only ones. We have Imperial Guard units arising in the 4th century, at the very least. I don't know if it actually goes back into the 3rd century, um, but these are called Scole and Domestici. And we also have groups of uh, riverine troops called Repenses. So some of those Limitanei also would actually, at certain points, become absorbed from the border regions into the uh, main field armies, the Comitatensis. But because they were Limitanei originally, sometimes in sources they get referred to then as uh, Pseudo-Comitatensis. So we've got all this stuff going on in the 300s. Now, where do the barbarians fit in? Well, the late Roman army built a military identity, okay, centered around the idea, around the concept of the barbarian. Um, so that might mean then that barbarians served in the military, right? Well, yes, kind of. It, it's a little more complex than that. Actually, it's a lot more complex. So, um, militaries are often worlds unto their own. If anybody watching this is part of a military family, maybe you've moved around a lot, or maybe you just have a father or an uncle or somebody in the military, then you know exactly what I'm talking about, all right? And the late Roman army was really no different here. Like, for example, you know, they spoke Latin. Of course they did. But that Latin, because they're positioned on the frontiers, because they are recruiting Germans um, and other people from Central Europe or, you know, maybe the steppe, that Latin gets spiced with non-Latin words, principally Germanic words, but, you know, other non-Latin words as well, and it forms this 
a weird kind of rough frontier dialect that's Latin, but like not really. It has specific terminology that doesn't show up elsewhere. So we have that going on. Now to continue this discussion of of the late Roman army, of the late Roman military world, and how soldiers kind of fit into Roman society in general. I'm actually going to pick on my family, and I'm going to use my family as an example. So my cousin Tim is a Marine, actually, if I'm remembering correctly. He's the um, leader of his squadron. But anyway, my point is that my cousin is a Marine. So when I see Tim in his fatigues, I know he's a soldier. But when he takes them off and he puts on regular clothing like jeans and a t-shirt you know aside from the haircut if you were to go see him in public you probably wouldn't be able to tell that he was in the marine corps but if you go back to late antiquity you can always always tell that i am a civilian and my cousin tim is a soldier now why is this the case and the answer is uh, well we're not clear on what this thing was okay but the Codex Theodosianus, which was a law code written in 398, tells us that the Roman armament workers, the people that worked in um, factories, which were called uh, fabrikai, so this is where, you know, swords, shields, etc. were mass-produced, they tell us that the factory workers have to be uh, branded with the national mark. We don't know what that is, really. Just as soldiers were branded. Okay, so we know there's a brand or something involved. And similarly, Vegetius uh, tells us that troops were marked with what he calls the Mark of the Legion or the Mark of the Eagle. Um, we don't know what this was. National Mark, Mark of the Legion. Okay, it's some kind of a, a signifier. There's an argument that it might have been a tattoo, maybe a blue tattoo of an eagle on the back of your hand, as I recall reading somewhere once, and I don't remember where. It might have been an actual brand, as the Codex Theodosianus tells us. Um, but my point is that if you were to transport me and my cousin back into this period, he's got the mark. It's never going away because it's a tattoo or brand. It's stained into his flesh somewhere. And you can always mark him out, and I don't. So you always know who the soldier is. My point, okay, is that the late Roman army had its own thing going on. Now, it's not like, you know, when you're talking about the barbarians and the use of barbarians in the Roman Empire in late antiquity, it's not like the Romans had never recruited from beyond the frontiers and now this is like a newfangled thing. They always had. We know from late antique sources and from archaeology, okay, that they were recruiting from across the frontier and as far afield as... Um, Scandinavia. And like I said, they had done this during the Principate era. There were, you know, Germanic bodyguards, etc. that served in the Roman army. So it's not like this is a new thing. What was new? What does matter? Uh, for this whole discussion of a barbarization thesis, for this whole discussion of barbarians serving in the late Roman army, okay, is that there were clear differences between a soldier, a barbarian, and a civilian. To be a barbarian was to be a soldier. Barbarians were soldiers. To be a goth was to be a soldier, eventually. That's what goths did. That's what Romans thought goths did. To be a Frank, in the Roman imagination, was to be a soldier. Franks were soldiers. Barbarians were soldiers. So when you talk about, like, you know, and I've brought this up before in other videos, when you talk about, like, ideas of, um ethnicity and barbarian tribes and you're like oh well the goths moved from this area into the roman empire the franks moved from this area into the roman empire you have to understand that there are i mean it's not that that's like wrong it's just that there are aspects of frankish identity or gothic identity etc that got reinforced in the context of the roman empire that may not have existed outside of the roman empire so to be a goth inside the borders of the Roman Empire might not have meant the same thing if you were to cross the Danube and you went back to Gothia. So when you're talking about barbarian tribes and ethnogenesis, you have to keep in mind that this probably was something of an ongoing, ever-changing process. So back to my point, to be a barbarian was to be a soldier. And contrary to what was going on in earlier time periods, um, the Roman army in late antiquity was not necessarily a path to... Uh, Romanization. It's not like you do your 20, 25 years and then you get your citizenship and you're out and you get your nice farm. Often the opposite was the case. It's a path towards barbarization because the army used barbarian imagery so heavily. Why? Because it was terrifying and it looked cool. 
That's that's it. It was terrifying and it looked cool. It scared people. So late Roman soldiers dressed like barbarians. They wore long pants, trousers. They wore uh, long sleeve tunics, which were shorter than what Romans were used to, especially in earlier times. They had belts, whose buckles informed us of the wearer's rank and informed others at the time period of others' rank. Uh, they wore male armor, so not the Lorica Segmentata anymore. Their helmets looked nothing like earlier Gallic types. The rectangular scutum was gone, replaced by um, an ovular shield. The more famous, you know, Pompeian Gladius or the Mines Gladius. Those short swords, those are gone, replaced by the Spatha, a long sword. So there's not necessarily like a huge effective difference, at least in theory, between the, the Gladius and the Spatha. The Spatha is just a longer gladius, but it matters because these were all mass-produced in factories called Fabricae, and the pants and swords. The Spatha specifically evoked barbarian imagery because this is what the barbarians used. So, barbarian equipment, this is what they used because it looks terrifying. And this also bleeds over into the civilian government um, because the civilian government had aspects of dress like the belt, it's worn by the bureaucrats. The late Roman government is basically militarized. Now, interestingly enough, okay, what the Romans thought barbarians wore, like brooches and uh, torques, like pants, well, maybe not pants themselves, but certainly like the style of the pants, etc. A lot of that stuff doesn't necessarily show up in Central Europe. Um, so, to a degree, the barbarization was based on what Romans thought the barbarians looked like. So it's using ethnic stereotypes again. Now, going along with that, we also have this problem, which we touched on earlier in the video of, you know, did the Romans actually serve in the Roman army? Um, or did Germans? Was it barbarized because of that? Was there a lack of patriotism or some other weird thing coming out of, you know, Edward Gibbon's The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire? Uh, the short answer is that we probably can't really quantify this to any really meaningful degree, and we'll talk about why that is in a moment, but some studies have suggested that about half, if not more, maybe up to two-thirds, uh, three-quarters of the imperial bodyguard units were actually Romans. The rank and file is much more difficult to deal with. So, in sources like the uh, Notitia Dignitatum and other other sources which record, you know, Roman military units. We have these unit names, Franchi, uh, Sarmati, uh, Atacoti, Vesi, by which the Romans meant Goths. Um, you know, so all, all of these are quote-unquote barbarian names, right? Franchi, Franks, uh, Sarmati, Sarmatians, etc. Now, probably some barbarians were recruited into these units based on ethnicity, but it would be a huge mistake, in fact, it would basically be wrong to think of the Franchi unit as being comprised solely of ethnic Franks. Now, why is this the case? Well, the answer is it goes back to the whole, you know, the Romans used barbarian stuff. They used barbarian chic because it was terrifying and it looked cool. Barbarians were terrifying to the Romans, so the likely answer, okay, is that units were named after barbarian peoples because they were scary or possibly to honor their military prowess, just like the United States Army uses Black Hawk helicopters and Tomahawk missiles. Um, we also have units named after much older people, like the uh, Batavi Signores, the Senior Batavians, named after the Batavi people. We also have a unit in late antiquity named after the Sabines, an ancient Italic people the Romans fought uh, back during the Republican years. It is extremely unlikely Okay, that recruitment was drawn solely from those people. Now, maybe initially it was. We don't really know. But we also know that army units in this period, okay, they have legacies and, and traditions that they are proud of. And we also know that units compete with each other on the battlefield for valor uh, and for honor. So it's very probable that these names have more to do with um, stereotypes and, and reputations than anything else. Like I said, the barbarian imagery was used because it was terrifying and it looked cool. Now, the barbarians do serve in large numbers, um, but this was partly because the Romans had a recruitment issue, not a manpower issue, which isn't really the same thing. Um, now, this is where we get into the whole, well, what does it mean to have a barbarian serve in the Roman Empire? Can we really quantify that? Uh, because we have very little evidence to suggest that barbarians who served were disloyal, or at least, you know, were actively disloyal, but Let's say you were a Frank, okay? 
who lived across the Rhine frontier. Um, you think of yourself as a Frank, but you've got an uncle, or, or a brother, or a cousin. Somebody, somebody in your family serves in the Roman army. Alright. Um, and he goes back and forth across the Rhine frontier. Sometimes he brings his uh, unit with him, or at least his, his squadron. So you grow up seeing, you know, late Roman army life. You grow up seeing the equipment. Um, maybe you know the frontier dialect, etc. And now you're like 25 and you need a job. Um, well, you have a family member in the Roman army, so you use that connection to get a job in the Roman army as a soldier. But you're a Frank. Who's serving in the Roman army? 20 years go by, 25 years go by, maybe you've got a son by this point and he joins up. Um, so your family are Franks, you're ethnically Franks, but you serve the Roman army, and you've been doing this for so long that this just becomes what your family does. You probably, at this point, have adopted a Roman name. So, let's say that goes on for, I don't know, two, three, four generations. Well, you're ethnically Frankish, right? Or at least, you should be. You speak Frankish, but you also are bilingual, you know Latin, or at the very least, you know the frontier dialect. You might have a Frankish name, but you also have a Roman name. You have a Latin name. And your family's been doing this for so long that maybe you see yourselves as Roman soldiers who just happen to be Franks. Well, what are you? Are you Frankish? Are you Roman? Can you have multiple identities? Depending on the context or the, or the situation. So my point is that the whole barbarian served in the Roman army and corrupted it thing and destroyed its fighting capabilities, that's not so simple. It's really, really difficult because people make careers out of this and it bleeds into their identities. So anyone who attempts to simplify this will probably end up being wrong because, as I hope this video kind of made clear, there's a lot of nuance to it. So guys, that's it for now. I kind of reached the end of what I want to talk about here. So in future videos, we'll keep going in depth with, you know, every one of these themes I brought up. So I hope you enjoyed. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you all next time.